<laughs> I felt like I did a dance to get here today. Um, just with the time changing here in Mexico, and I guess it did in Malta. And uh, anyway, I'm going to do a really quick introduction. Uh, my name's Christine Anderson. Claudia and I have had a website and two YouTube channels for seven years now. Wow. Seven yeah. years, huh? There's, yeah. there's a magic number. I guess so. I guess this yeah. is a magic day. <laughs> and Congratulations. I would like to introduce our good friend, Randy Moggins of Off Planet Radio. Um, and Randy, you and I had a conversation last week, I would say probably after it's been a year since we had spoken. It's and not been that long. Uh, we did uh, a joint well, we did, we did, uh, we earlier in the year sometime, sometime with sometime. Uh, Shane and um, uh, our friend Niels Kunz, yeah. and um, Claudia was in on that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, gathering of the community from time to time. Yeah. So kind of leading into what's running around in my mind this morning, and it's been there for a while, you and I talked last Sunday, and we went into the logos, we went into the Christed body, we went into a lot of things that I think are probably the most important themes that we could speak about in this closing of an age. Mm -hmm. And using your eye, eye of the needle metaphor, something that I'm very in tune with also, and where, where and what and how do we become the beings that we know we are inside in this closing time? So, Randy, I just if you just give a little introduction, even going back to your days in alternative Christian radio, doesn't have to be too long, and where you are today. So I started uh, on shortwave radio with a, a network out of uh, Oregon, in 2003, that was after I was on local radio, AM radio here in Southern Pennsylvania. And um, that was basically a sojourn into what was called alternative Christian radio at that time, meaning it was kind of a blend of the patriot movement and the religious movement that was moving outside of the established church system. So one of the big topics at that time was the fact that the churches were incorporated under 501c3 licensing here in the United States, and that that is uh, what you call tacit contracts with Vatican, Bank of England, uh, World Bank, in other words, the, the churches or corporations that are linked to what we call the hierarchy. And this was a movement that was moving outside of it. It was going into home churches. It was also at that time responding a lot to what had happened in uh, Waco as a result of obviously, you know, going in with military and tanks and plowing down an entire community and killing men, women, and children. And um, the Oklahoma City Murrah building bombing as well so there was not unlike today there was a lot of reactionism coming from what you now call the far right wing the maga movement and this um i guess liberal liberal movement which is more humanistically inspired and then in the middle of that is the breadth of humanity which is caught in this quandary of not knowing which side to choose so I was basically a commentator starting out and then moved into um, deciphering what started out as the book of Revelation and became the entire Bible over seven years. Another, there we go again, another seven. We did that for seven years on shortwave, three years, and then four more years streaming on the internet. At um, <clears throat> the junction of about 2010, 2011, um, I separated myself from that to a large degree. That was the formation then of what became Off Planet Radio. And it was my desire then to move Off Planet Radio in a different direction, more towards the esoteric. I wanted to talk about the deep state. I wanted to talk about UFOs, extraterrestrials, uh, occultism. Uh, I did not want to be hamstrung any longer by the doctrines of a church that told me that I was a sinner born in sin and had to make atonement through a third party who had allegedly died a horrific death on the cross for my sake. 
And so I, that began the long journey coming forward to where we are now. In 2019, I sort of <clears throat> deplatformed again. I had been working with Emily Moyer on Off Planet Media, and I went into the eye of the needle in uh, exactly. Today is, by the way, Halloween, October 31st. It is Samhain. It was exactly three years ago that I began the Eye of the Needle. It was Halloween night of 2019. So, um, boy, a lot of convergence here. So that's that's the thumbnail sketch of where I come from. Okay. Yeah, and so here we are, you know, and I, I, I uh, coincidentally, and I think a lot of us in, let's just call it the truth, love, resonance field, we're all getting information we're receiving it through our own unique voices, just as I got. And I, when I didn't know you were doing, but I was doing writing about yeah. the eye of the needle, mm -hmm. right? And right. so the, one of the things I think is really important, maybe it'll enter, uh, drive us into a deep conversation, is we were speaking of, and I'm feeling it, and I'm seeing it all across the virtual world right now, or people that are really awake that have gone through uh, ancient texts, lost history, UFOs, abductions, MK Ultra, all of these aspects, and coming to this point of perception, which is there's a script being run, and this goes to Revelations yeah. also. There is definitely a script being run, and it it's like our withdrawing our consent and our energy from that script. Because with the prevalence of our, our laptops and our phones, we can always be connected to the prevailing story of the moment. And we can watch how humans go from COVID to mm. Ukraine to this to that. Right now, it's Elon Musk and take over of Twitter. But, <laughs> that, I mean, but, you know, it's like when I look at it and I've been feeling it really strongly for a good month, more and more, is like, this is to keep us driven in their narrative instead of using our own creative abilities and becoming that which we are so that our consciousness is the prevailing consciousness that's going to bring us in to whatever new epoch we're going into. And it's just helped me a lot to at least know that. Like I can look at headlines and get all the news I need. Yeah. Which is, how much news do you need? So, to unravel some of that, most of what we function in is what I call the construct, the simulacrum. Um, our friend Jason over at Archaics calls it the simulacrum. The simulacrum. Um, we're in some sort of materialized existence realm that either was created by us, for us, or by some third party to ensnare us. And so even within the construct itself, in the present age, and because of the ubiquity of devices, computers, phones, tablets, televisions, and the blanketing of the planet with the World Wide Web, the spider's web, um, we live in an information field. We've always we've, we've always lived in an information field to some degree, even going back into what so-called primitive times. Man was driven then by the natural world, which is an information field as well. It's a very sophisticated information world. And the question becomes, how much externalized information do we require to function and what is the nature of that information as it interacts with our consciousness? What is our consciousness? What is the core of all of this? And increasingly, if you look at the world right now, you see the schismatic nature of it in that it's so highly polarized that literally there's things you, most things we can't talk about. You know, we can't have public conversations anymore that contest the major narratives, whatever they are, whether they're COVID, whether they are they are the uh, political estates that are warring factions, both sides, the, the, the two divisions, red state, blue state, 
MAGA versus the liberals, these are all schismatic eminences that that have forced us supposedly to choose between one side or another when, in fact, what we're viewing, in my opinion, are really just fragments, shattered shards of a mirror that broke a long time ago that is our our consciousness as a collective. And, you know, this obviously drives it right into, I think, where you've gone with your recent articles on, on uh, Earth Empaths as, as well. Well, exactly. And, you know, I mean, we use analogy in our language. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I pointed out in the last piece I wrote was that our ability to to speak has been really curtailed because people don't understand the words they use. Matter of fact, they hardly use words anymore. <laughs> Most times that I'm I in communications, it's yeah. emojis, misspellings. And so I have to use my intuition to even understand what the person is trying to get across. But during all of that, you know, I mean, I'm going to use an analogy right now uh, because it kind of divides between now. I know Claudia is really into growing mushrooms, the world of mycelium, fermentation, the organic realm. Uh, and, yeah. and so for me, that organic realm, that mycelium, that interconnected language between the trees, the plants, and all of that is somehow representative yeah. of our organic reality. And then when you look at spider's webs, because you brought that up and I, I sat with it for a while, Randy. And you know what I remember? I remembered back on on that forum that I was the moderator and Claudia and I were moderators mm -hmm. on, uh, when people were first becoming aware of the technological abilities, a lot of people were having an experience of seeing spiders, uh, mm -hmm. astral spiders come out of their devices. And it was quite a, a phenomena for a while, right? And so it, it's, uh, and then I had just heard somebody else say, well, if you took a spider web, and you took it out of the gossamer beauty and the light and the shining in the nature where it's connected to nature and you made it, uh, it's the web itself is super strong. We see it as super fine and gossamer, but what, if you were to project it out into a larger cable, it's mm -hmm. almost breakable. And so you can kind of see the metaphor there of what they're trying to do with the digital realm. Yeah. And, you know, and, and pull us all into this technological mainframe of control system, which, in my opinion, and I'll let Claudia speak here because I know we've talked about it. It's not going to ever work. I already see it breaking down. It, it can't because it's only <clears throat> an imitation of nature. And there are like there are places in life where you need to imitate or copy what nature does but when the moment this turns towards the evil side because we live in a dualistic world i mean that's you know there's no denying it um <clears throat> the moment it turns that way it turns away from nature and it becomes all but a cheap copy you know made in china toy lasts five minutes Right. And it, it can never imitate spirit. <clears throat> that's no. the, that's the, that's the, I think for the most folks right now, it's like, what is spirit? What is the, what is creator? Where is the spirit coming from? And you can go take it to the ether. It's the all pervading field of intelligence that can't be copied. It can't be hacked. It can't be. And how much power do we as individuals have within that manifestation? via our own resonance you know i mean we can get even getting out of our intellectual uh, understanding of a lot of things whether it's scripture or, or we, we pick up from somebody else's the, the simulation the simulacrum the holographic universe which probably fits our world view uh who are we within that those primordial questions that are very challenging to anybody well any ego no matter what ego it is, what's trying desperately to hold on to something that is clearly going away. Yeah. <clears throat> so a number of things there. Who are we? 
in this creation. And, you know, it goes back to, and you cited it in your article, I believe, I think, therefore, I am. And on this plane, this field, this construct, our thoughts define us both individually and collectively. But our thoughts, as I believe uh, Al Spensky pointed out as well, really aren't ours either, at least not most of them. So even within our thought processes, there's kind of inside of us a, a spider's web as well. Oh, look at the kitty. That's Katrina. Hello. <laughs> when cats show up, you know you're having the kind of conversation that that that's going the way it's supposed to. Right. They're attracted to the resonance field of it. And they're connected like hell. I mean, yeah, that's or... that's crazy connected animal there. Mm -hmm. So the natural world is is the closest thing that we have is an extension of our biological existence, in my opinion. It is the closest we can anchor to something in material world that is true to our character and our nature. Now, having said that, if you look at nature, much like the construct of humanity, we like to think of nature as placid and gentle and Ever effervescent and flowing, and it is all of those things, but it's also a violent kingdom. It is mm -hmm. a kingdom in which, in order to survive, one being of some format, whether it's um, uh, 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 another animal, another insect, another plant, something perishes in order for the biological entity to exist. And, and nature on that level is constantly running energy fields that consume and then also reconvey energy via a biological process. So when you look at it from that standpoint, it it does reflect us and it is the closest roots that we have. When we reflect upon nature, we probably see the truest format for what we are slash were meant to be which begs the question meant to be by whom and <laughs> we'll hopefully get to that down the road but i you know in reflecting on nature it's the place we can go to to reconnect to who we are biologically and also etherically because in nature the fields are wide open right now <clears throat> we're in the season of Halloween, Samhain, which is a liminal season. It's a season between seasons in that it's kind of twilight. It's the twilight of the later part of the year. And it's said that the veil thins and that the nature spirits come forward, the ancestral spirits come forward. Uh, a friend of mine, Kristen, sent me an article uh, a few days ago that brilliantly exposed this, talking about the ancestors and how we work through the ancestors and the ancestors work through us. And Kristen knows me. She's followed my material. She knows that my guides, the receivers, have talked extensively about the continuum, which is a part of us. And in explaining that, I will say that, that from the standpoint of what I've been writing with the receivers' material, there is a continuum, and that continuum consists of us as soul beings. It consists of us as being multiple beings in multiple times at multiple points in time, or what I call aspect selves. And then the continuum also goes into the oversoul higher self and the ancestral beings who inhabit what we call our personal conveyance through space and time and so in honoring the ancestors we essentially reach both forward and backward at the same time i had an experience years ago when i was still doing bible prophecy where i began exploring words in the old testament having to do with the word generations and what that exactly meant there was almost like it was almost like a revelation at some point to me anyway of looking at 
the Hebrew words, which when you're using um, all of these different uh, concordances to decipher Hebrew, uh, Hebrew is a very different language. It's read from right to left. It has numeric values within it. It doesn't have the construction of language that we have in Westernized languages. And in fact, when you're dealing with Hebrew, specifically in this case, you're dealing with a language written by people who are of a completely different mindset than what we understand here in modern Westernized culture. Mm -hmm. And so going through these words, which are symbols, they're glyphs, I had the revelation that everything flows forward and backward like a river all at once. So in effect, in time, we are in time, but we are an instance of time in this consciousness. But in fact, we exist in multiple times, multiple temporal fields at any given time as expressions of ourselves, which are aspects which are basically the expressions of any and all of the thoughts, impulses, ideas, concepts that we bring forward. We are all of these things at once. We instantiate one aspect in this reality. That's complex for most people. It's complex for me to consider. I mean, when you you know you talk about a mind screw, that's one of them. And right. I think you know I think this is where partaking of the holy mushroom sometimes can really help people because it gives you an opportunity to to jettison the coil long enough to engage time on on a real sense that that pulse that gently sits there in the background, which is a radiance field. I don't remember exactly where we were in this narrative as I unfolded it, but that's essentially what the eye of the needle is. The eye of the needle is this journey through the spiral, and the spiral grows very wide at one end, and it grows very tight as we go down till we go to a single point, which is a singularity, not the singularity of the robots, but the singularity of consciousness, which reunifies back with the continuum which is both ourselves and the others which are expressed in us and through us at any given time, and then ultimately back to the oversoul, which extends from creator. I, I, to I totally understand that. I'm sure Claudia does also. <laughs> so somebody I do explain it to I me. Do because for me, it's experiential. And yeah. Kristen yeah. is also a friend of ours. <laughs> and for the last year and a half, Claudia and I have with another friend of ours, Barbara, have been mm -hmm our genetics right and mm -hmm. our ancestry and my whole call to standing rock that was all an ancestral let's say aspect of my being that had to go there to have have that and it 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 again we're we're stuck with language randy i'm glad you brought up the hebrew because inside of me is this is this song it's a song and like a song it it goes backwards and forwards. It has a rhythm. It has this. And so I've been one very fortunate in my life through, you know, a lot of it came through breaks with reality and trauma, but I've remembered, I've had very clear memory of different lifetimes, even going mm -hmm. back to Atlantis, mm -hmm. but they're not like full on lifetimes. They're like echoes. They're like waves. They're like this resonance. Right. And to the point where I am now, it's very, within me to know that this is what I am right here, right now. It, it, I, I know it, I can't express it because we're, we're living in this very now present moment, but I, I feel like it is very important. And another, one more thing that a lot of people that have explored their ancestral lines, either through memory or research or in any way we get to that, realize that many of us are here to break the negative ancestral lines. Like I know that as I heal, as I become the most, uh, I want to say pure, because, you know, I don't look at myself like, oh, you're really pure. But as I become a more pure being, I'm more pure in contact with creator source, more centered in my own peace. I know that this re reverberation is going <laughs> backwards and forwards in time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know how that all exactly fits in. And yet it, it, it's real for me, at least for right now. This is my reality. This is the place that I'm 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 coming from. Right. When I'm trying to put words on 
a page or I'm having a conversation with somebody, having a conversation with both of you. Claudia, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Um, the way I'm seeing it, like the more we search and learn from our search, from our trauma, from alleged mistakes we make and so on and so forth, it's kind of, it's like, Randy, you said like the singularity. I see it as a dissolve, a natural organic dissolvement of duality because at the end of the day, we know that duality is not really there. Like it, it's, you know, two extremes of the same thing. And as that, as we, I don't know, grow spiritually for lack of better phrase, um, we realize that more and more. And eventually the duality will dissolve. It, it just, you know, it, it won't be there anymore. It's so what... It's, I, I think it's mirrored a lot in what we've come to understand on a scientific level with what we call quantum physics. And this was the problem that Einstein had, the reckoning, um, the work of other physicists such as Schrodinger, was that he literally had to create a special relativity theorem in his mind to resolve what was effectively the resolution of duality, which was in terms of light being uh, particles or waves, which the double sp slit experiment, which goes back to what the 1800s demonstrated um, what we thought we knew about of the most fundamental aspect of our existence in this world light itself was that <clears throat> it was both particle and wave. And in fact, it could shift based at least upon what they understood to be the observation or the observer. And we extended that into, you know, the realm of, of, philosophy, theology, um, psychology. Um, again, like Einstein, I think Freud would have, Freud was, Freud struggled with this, although I can't remember reading anything Freud had to say about it directly based on what I understand about Freudian's, Freudian psychology, he would have struggled with it, whereas Jung seems to have embraced it to a, a wider degree. So that taught us that duality isn't real. It is simply a question of two states being reconciled at any given time into what we would call a single beam of light. And it's interesting because light becomes the metaphor even in the New Testament. You mm -hmm. know, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And, and it's constantly underscored in that way so that we understand this again the duality between light and darkness you know and, and it says the light saw the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not why because darkness is a void and light is a full presence of an energy eminence and so you know even dealing with the constructs of the universe expressed through our theological texts we're still dealing with duality which means we have to deal with du duality even though i think people who meditate, people who do entheogenic drugs at some point understand there is a point of collapse and it's a collapse of consciousness, a collapse of time, and that we live in between in this liminal state. So here we are in Halloween, the twilight of the seasons, and we are in fact in a twilight of a season of an age. Exactly. Well, it, it's interesting. Again, we use words, so duality, right? And then there's another world, word called polarity, right? Mm -hmm. And so as I understand it through study of plasma physics and electrical universe model and all the other, you know, ways of trying to find out what is this realm we're living in, polarity is the fundamental basis of physical material reality. 
right? But it's ethereal also, right? But you have the negative and positive charge. Mm -hmm. You have the magnetic field, right? And within that field, this creation takes place. I think the duality aspects comes is that we're divided within ourselves more than anything else, right? We have these two hemispheres. And like you brought up earlier, the rights of arguing with the left, right? So where's yeah. our central point of unity, right? And perhaps all of this is just a setup from whenever the creation and, you know, as we're going through this time, and like you say, we're at the end of a season, we're at the end of an epic, like how do we, and this is my search, right? To formalize within myself a crystalline of enough of a of an understanding, a light, if you will, that has taken in all of it. It's not leaving anything out. It doesn't leave out the shadow. It doesn't leave out the games. It doesn't leave out the the horror. It doesn't leave out the joy and the beauty. It's all of it. And so, I had a thought this morning. I'm kind of curious to what I think, but. I'm like every once in a while, and I'm sure we all experience this all the time. There's like doubt. There's a shadow of a shadow. A shadow of a doubt. Right. But now it came to me this morning. It's a shadow of my shadow. In other words, it doesn't have a huge amount of power, but it's a necessary part of me. Because it's always reminding me as I go into my thought or my analytical processes or having an encounters with people to remain aware, it's just that. Like we all can make mistakes. We all do make mistakes. We all have thoughts sometimes that are not of the highest form. So in a way, it's sort of like all of a sudden my shadow became just my friend, but in, in, that, in that essence of it. So, because I feel uncomfortable when I'm not like on and I'm not vital energy and I'm not out there moving through the world with some sort of like purpose or whatever. And doubt tells me or shadow tells me, slow down. There's no hurry here. Take time to rectify within yourself that which you are, you know, so that because I feel like this is going to become the most vital aspect of moving through this eye of the needle or actually the other metaphor is the eye of the storm. Can we stay? Both, yeah, this is the same, yeah. Okay, right, steady. Can we be seated in peace? Can we be not moved by all these outer forces? And they, all the outer forces have been to drive us away from home, been drive us away from the, our own being. In that, in, in that, summary you just put forward you know there's this concept of the shadow the shadow is real mm -hmm. um the shadow like the reflection in the mirror is what tells you that you exist in a world of darkness and light it's that contrast mm -hmm. and the more i've gone through this is just from a personal standpoint <clears throat> um those who follow me know that, you know, I've had the last few years have been difficult health-wise, that I've grappled with my physicality to a large degree. And I'm happy to say that I'm doing really well right now. Having said that, I've also had to grapple with mortality and grapple with, you know, what is this body and what is my responsibility to it? Is it me? Is it the totality of me? Is it an expression of me? And in moments when I have been, let's just say, facing mortality, when I'm willing to concede, okay, this won't go on forever. Um, you know, I certainly don't feel like it's over, but there is a finite timeline that goes with, with mortality. Mm -hmm. And there is also the point where you begin to try to reconcile a physical existence with what is beyond that. Something that, you know, I think, I think most of our culture avoids this. It's interesting. You're in Mexico and Mexico sort of embraces this because they have these celebrations of the dead and they sort of embrace that. And, and Western culture, our culture seems to want to reject all of that. It's almost, it's denialism on some level. You know, 
we don't want to deal with the shadow. We don't want to deal with the corpse. We don't want to deal with what sits on the other side of the so-called veil. Right. While at the same time, we are hurling through the veil collectively as, as humanity. And our shadow is being shown to us magnified thousands and thousands of times right now. If you just look at the world that has evolved, I see, my starting point sometimes is 2012, because I do think there was something to 2012. I think where it really kicked in was the Great Eclipse in 2017. I believe that was a fulcrum event that shifted what I call the temporal platforms on planet Earth and for a period of seven years. I also believe that this time was sort of given to us to deal with our shadow aspect on a collective level. Yeah. So hence you have you have basically a collapsing world system. I mean, just you you look around, nothing works. I mean, and, and, and we don't need, you know, and for people who think that it, it requires total collapse, don't speak that into existence because it is necessary that the system not totally collapse in order for us to sustain our physicality within this world. There's a civilization, there's a structure. <clears throat> Somebody once said to me, um, were it not for the occultists and the Freemasons, we wouldn't even have indoor plummet. And to some degree or another, maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, it seems to me like probably if you look at the people that are doing Tartaria research, it looks like they probably bombed the hell out of what was the last great civilization and handed us the sh shards of it, the remnants of it, to rebuild something. And we've sort of, again, going back earlier, we've sort of built a crude representation of what these great civilizations once were. Nevertheless, whatever level of civilization we have now sustains us physically, and we shouldn't denigrate that. This gives us space to be introspective if we know how to use it collectively. You know, the, the media is busy keeping us entrained, entertained with media figures, with politicians, movie stars, rock stars, hip hop artists, sports figures, and all of the tumult that goes with it in order to keep us separated because we're always looking at the victim, victimizer situation. Somebody, somebody is an active agent in the misery of another person and somebody else has to suffer for somebody else in, to be happy. These are the, the duality waves that are the cancer. The real cancer isn't duality, it's our injection into them on that psychological level where we're interacting with negative synthetic energies that are created to keep us inside of the rabbit hole rather than being able to ever surface yeah I, I, you know i've looked at a lot of tataria and a lot of other ancient you know uh history and matter of fact even tataria now because of the way it's going i think once we put a label on a movement that movement starts to corrupt itself mm -hmm. because people become the voices of it, right? And well, that so movement came out of Flat Earth, which had, you know, that had been sort of taken over as well. There were truths. There are truths in all of this. I'll talk about all of that right now in my own perspective, because it, it is all within everything that's being. And I, first of all, Randy, let me say, I agree with you that the negative emotion of wanting to see it all collapse is in itself a negative emotion. Mm -hmm. okay? And but when you were talking because of uh I don't call it flat earth, I call it the still infinite plane of creation, right? Because that takes it out of the physicality of it. And people mm -hmm. are gonna talk about that back and forth forever. Right. And so when you're sitting in the let's say you're sitting in magnetic north on this plane of creation, right? That means you're upright and you're in tune with the creator with the the true North Pole of your own being. It runs through mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. And so when you were saying that, it was like, there's something in motion 
let's just call it for the moment, the firmament with all the luminaries and all these, they're all intelligences and they're yes. all moving in a, in a manner that if you can tune into it, you will, you'll see this great harmonic happening in the higher mind. Mm -hmm. While the lower astral plane is all what you said. It's bring somebody else down, get mad. You know, I mean, even I'm guilty of it to some degree to when I say MPC or things like that. Yeah. And yet when I'm in contact with physical, because I have this cafe, right? So I get to see people come in and out. Surprising sometimes who comes in here and who does. And I have what I, I, I know is the salt of the earth friends. They don't know any of the stuff we're talking about. But they're salt of the earth. They're good people. Yeah. You know, and they're just such good people. And they're they're doing so they don't I, they don't get anything. I mean, we'll talk and we'll discuss things, but there is uh, you know, from the beautitudes, right? You know, I would just different aspects of what we call Jesus. We could just say a Christ voice said is like be loving and be kind and forgive your neighbors and forgive your enemies. These are these are things that don't sound just like coming out of my mouth. You have to sit and contemplate what is the meaning of that? You know, what 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 is it? Because most people I see most of the time are bothered and angry and blaming somebody else, no matter what it is, being a personal mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. Claudia, I'm interested in what you think about the expression of this duality. Well, it's a it's a fact in in our reality. Um, I also think that a certain a certain set of people have utilized this fact of duality for their own purposes mm -hmm. that are not necessarily for the benefit of all who live in this reality. But <clears throat> my experience so far tells me that by simply accepting that all duality is, is two ends of the same thing, like if you are, if you look at something in its center, you only see the one thing. Mm -hmm. If you venture out to the far right, it looks completely different. And if you venture out to the far left, it looks completely different again. And if you compare the one at the far left and the far right, you can't really tell anymore what the center of it looks like. But coming to realize yeah. that, makes it kind of, I don't know, easier. It, it makes the consciousness somewhat much lighter. I cannot explain it in any other way. I hesitate to do this, but I'm going to pull it in anyway. What about the off-world influences, the off-world presence, and how that interplays with... In our episode, because if we talk about this, we talk about the Greys, we call, talk about the Draco, we talk about the Anunnaki, and what I call the old gods. And humanity, in a lot of ways, feels like it's been on a chessboard being moved by invisible forces that have now um, somehow thrust us into turmoil. And I'm curious as to what both of you think about this. Well, I'm glad you brought it up because it was in my, in my, you know, I mean, this is a big question, is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody that's been studying down all these different fields and having experiences, mm -hmm. talking to people that have been abducted, uh, you know, the whole Sumerian scenario with the Anunnaki and all of that, right? Yeah. And, you know, on a personal level, I've had contact with reptilians. Mm -hmm. Not in a physical form, but in the astral form. And like we were talking, Randy, my communication was completely telepathic. It was an exchange mm -hmm. of consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Completely. Uh, Claudia has always said one thing when you're uh, confronting anything 
that appears scary, Draco, you know, outworld, something you've not really, give it your consciousness, right? If we, uh, you know, it's like, instead of being afraid of these things, instead of making them our enemies, which is what most of it's done, most of the dialogue within those communities has pinpointed <clears throat> some other race as our enemy. They did it. It happened from because of them, right? But if you open up in a consciousness field, with whether it's a demon, whether it's a ghost, whether it's a an, an alien presence, you can actually have communion. And if you don't run away in fear or you don't attack. That's interesting because that was Whitley Strieber's title to his book, Communion, which was about his alien experiences. And... To me, it feels like we've seen... Go ahead, Claudia, please. I don't want to call them alien because aliens have that connotation of being yeah. non-earthly, whereas I see it as they are on Earth. They are just in that slightly different frequency where most human beings nowadays cannot see them. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense if you go back to the firmament model and all of these luminaries that we see in the sky, right? Yeah. How many different realms are there out there? So it's not like they have to come in a spaceships from these god awful, yeah. ridiculous, yeah. made up distances that NASA has told us, or you know, the current model is. No, they can transmit right from where they are. You know, so we're having an experience like that's why I like to call it the infinite plane, right? So all of these things, whether it's coming from, you know, Orion or Pleiades or Sirius or any of the, and I've had experiences with all of these intelligences, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't need a construct that says they came and invaded the right here, right now. All of it's right here, right now. And, you know, who who tells us that they don't belong here. How come most people assume they don't have as much right to live here as we do? Yeah, hence the word aliens. And notice how that word's been weaponized. I mean, look how, yeah. oh, look yeah, how it was weaponized first in, in, in its application towards um, other beings, we'll say, from other realms. And then yeah. how it's been weaponized against people who how are you how are you an alien on your own world if you're human you well know, that's where knowing where a word originates from or even you know looking up the meaning of a word in a dictionary from 100 or 150 years ago is really really helpful because the word alien meant someone who is not in his own country. So if I'm going to the US, being a non-US um, human, <laughs> I don't like using person, um, that makes me an alien. From elsewhere, basically from elsewhere. Well, yeah. And I mean, if you come to Germany, you are aliens. Mm -hmm. Because... You're not Germans. So how do you feel about it, Randy? So it's 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 complicated. First off, the concept of the alien has to do with legal statuses, which goes into a whole other conversation. In other words, <laughs> yeah. uh, the establishment of nations and races upon the earth and the divisions of those goes way, 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 way back in time. And we assume that we came from one, you know, whatever it was, some alpha monkey, which is not true, and that we were some sort of divine spark creation rather than looking at the reality that perhaps we ourselves are terraformed beings biologically. Mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've come to accept that. I've come to accept it based on my own encounters with the beings and also based on everything that I've, I've come to know is that what are, whatever our physicality is, whatever the construct of our physical eminence in this, in this realm, 
we are not that we are spirits we are souls who came in to inhabit bodies that were created to live in this realm and when you begin to look at it from that standpoint you suddenly realize that there's no distance between us and the beings we attribute to being from uh, the old Carl Sagan, billions and billions and billions. Well, you can keep adding zeros on the numbers forever. They don't matter because that was man's system for counting. And past about three or four zeros, most of us become, you know, unable to reckon numbers and then we go to exponentials. But the truth of the matter is that you can collapse the universe into a single point. And you can expand the universe, and you can do the same thing with time. We can collapse time, we can collapse space in our consciousness. You know, the intelligences we see around us, as you were talking about, and it's so beautiful because when we understand the spectral eminences that surround us, but you know, as my guides have sort of sort of indicated, those really are existing within you in a way that we don't completely understand that we are in fact projecting a reality and that reality exists within us and we unfold it on a moment by moment basis in time because of limited consciousness that we inhabit so there really are no aliens they're really the wars that the wars on Earth are reflections of the wars in space, and the wars in space are reflections of the wars within us as individual beings. Off-world creatures are no different than humans. There are magnificent creatures, much like the ones that I met when I was a child, and there are horrific creatures who, you know, have deceived themselves, as many of the greys have, into believing that they can somehow reattain uh, a biological viability and and and, a, and an immortality which they don't exist don't necessarily possess as a race that's that's you know there's some deep <laughs> issues there's yeah. deep issues in all of this as to the nature of beings go ahead right. so no i'm just going to go in on the gray alien thing because that's the most prevalent way that people talk about encounters and abductions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have speculated that they are coming back in time to recover something they lost. That's exactly right. My friend. Right? So, but they're themselves, you know, they could be the shadow of where a technological world goes when it gives up its spirit. Right. Yeah. That what if they are our future selves? Exactly. Exactly. And that was a posture that we put forward with a friend of mine, in Mexico, named Carlos Del Angel, who we did a show probably seven years, eight years ago, where we talked about this, you know, our future self sending a message back. And it has to do with the singularity and it has to do with the present state of technology and AI and where we are being driven physically in this world as opposed to spiritually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this gets into... It's a deep area, you know, and I think what we're all fairly breaking through right now is that we've ex we're experiencers. That was a good word for anomalous experiencers. I mean, that was a word out there for a long time. There's been a lot of people that have really deeply looked into this, mm -hmm. but I feel like that veil is starting to clarify. Uh, and yet there's something that wants to... I mean, what we're clearly dealing with right now, wherever it came from, is a parasitical, predatory mindset, if you will. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, it is. A, stop right there, because that's actually a great place to put it. It's a mindset. There is, you know, the demiurge, the archontic aspect, is part of, I believe, the shadow self. And which is the collective consciousness <laughs> which manifested. Mm -hmm. And see, we filtered all of this through historical information that we've made sacred writ. Um, I, it's funny because I was going through an old text of the Sophia Pistis, 
or the Pista Sophia, and realizing that, you know, even in the foreword, they're saying, understand, these are translations of translations. Mm -hmm. The books that we have, this is the problem we bump up against with research, is that whatever we research, it is researching, and mm -hmm. it's reliant on a background of material that pre-exists our knowledge. In other words, we're taking it on authority that such and such happened linearly in a particular procession of time. And yet, what the guides showed me so brilliantly was how holographic inserts operate and how time can literally be... It was a conversation I had with Emily Moyer years ago when we were working together, and I said about the fact that looking back on my life, there were times when it felt like there were missing frames of film in a movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you can isolate and find that one frame, you can put it back into the linear narrative and things start to make sense again. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that it's not linear. It's not this logical progression. And that because of the concept that we can't absorb because we simply in this our brains and our consciousness in this present dimensional expression can't understand the occurrence of all things at once, of all things not being in a linear progression of time. That's, I get it. I get because I've struggled with it because it's just one of those ideas that's so disturbing. It's like dealing with, with non-duality. How do you deal with non-duality when you're living in a dual existence? It pretty much throws out, if, if if I say what I think I believe at this point, I really have nothing left to say, which is that we would just simply collapse the whole thing back down into the true singularity, which is the consciousness that has this sine wave that breathes and lives with creator, and that there is no duality anymore. But See, this is where, this is one of the big questions I think anybody... <laughs> That's dealt that yeah. ask himself, right? Because, yeah. and I think that's a, it, I, in a certain way, there are a lot of people like in the, you know, the new age ascension movement, that that is the thought that they've put out, right? Mm -hmm. That we're going to go back to a source creator, all duality is going to disappear. And then what? But like you were saying, life itself is a rhythm, it's a movement, it's, you know, things die, things get born again, right? And so, in in the way I've tried to resolve that in my head, I don't know if I've done a good job of it yet or not, is this whole collapsing, okay, of all of this that, you know, we, we all acknowledge that we're, something major is happening right now, right? We're going through something extremely that's not going to be stopped. So the, I start to feel it as this compression, this compression, and it's taking all of these timelines, my ancestors, my knowledge, you know, everything that that's experienced, like you were saying, and all these other uh, existences that are happening right now, and it's compressing it into, let's call it a crystallized being, which holds all that memory, but it compresses it down, if you want, to a diamond heart. That's why love is the most important thing that we realize right now. Mm -hmm. and well, we don't know what love is. And quite honestly, we only understand love from the standpoint of an expression of something we call love as an energy. Divine love right. itself. So that's what I'm saying, Randy, it's because we don't. We don't. Yeah. We can't in this. So when it's there, this becomes, it's like, I don't even know how to describe it because it's only been coming to me little by little that nothing is lost. All of those experiences. Yeah. yeah. See, there's lost. this concept of the fall. And this is where... So the first thing that you learn as a child when you're dealing with religion is, well, like, so, like, who's the D Jesus dude? And what's that about? And why would he need to die? And why was I born a sinner? And why is this world fallen? And this whole concept of a fallen world. And what if the major premise in all of this is that 
we've conceived ourselves as imperfect, broken, fallen, separated, divided, and polarized. But in fact, that's just the stream of images that we're experiencing while at the same time we've never left. The metaphor for this, and this is something I'm so slow at writing, but it's something that I started writing a couple of weeks ago, is imagine children. When you're very small, you'll go off like somewhere, you'll go off into the woods or the backyard or some secret. Children love secret places. I know I'm observing my grandkids doing this. And we go off and we have this imaginary world that we build. And, and it can be very menacing. I remember when I was a kid, we played the equivalent then to real-time Dungeons and Dragons, which was princes and fairies and dragons and dark lords. I mean, this is back before Star Wars. But it's the it's the same mythological story retold and recast in this concept. And we go into this in our imaginations because we're expressing duality. But at the end of the day, what happens is no matter how dark that world that that child built is, the Dungeons and Dragons scenario, the child goes home to mom and dad and he's safe back in the house and there's a warm meal there and there's a bed and there's love and there's comfort. And if you just extend the metaphor a little bit, you understand that we're experiencing a world which is giving us the concepts of duality and the experience of duality. But at the same time, there's a part of us that never left. We never fell. We never departed from the whole. We have simply individuated consciousness into a collective and then fragmented and sliced it and diced it in a way that it's very real and it is a simulation and this is something i had pointed out years ago to i think it was walter bosley that i was engaging with and and because i knew he would get the metaphor i said but this, he said i'm tired of people saying this is just a simulation and i went well simulations are useful did you ever play microsoft flight simulator because he was air force i mean they train pilots using software simulators for a reason, because the simulation is the way that you develop reflexes, you develop the, the neuroplasticity to be able to deal with evolving situations in real time. And that software, that software puts you through all of this and it accelerates as it's gone. It's it, this is, you know, I guess what you would call AI, it's intelligent learning to some degree. So would it surprise us to understand that we're in a flight simulator, and the simulation is speeding up rapidly now because we've reached a point where the haptic feedback coming from this is literally just vibrating us. It's vibrating us in a way that we then can go to another frequency where we get the ability to stand, even if just a moment, outside of this construct of reality and view it from the standpoint of the eternal. And I, I think that's what this is I about. It, does, it doesn't reject flight. any of this. <laughs> I, I'm going to go be a kid right now, okay? Because that's yeah. really, really, really important. You know, this is this rediscovering the wonder and the innocence of an inner child, right? So when you said flight simulator, that's what I want to call this reality now. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Learn how to fly yeah. again. It is. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant, but no, it is. And that's why uh, I think the three of us could talk for. But I wouldn't bring Claudia into this because I were to told her a little bit about our conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And what is that word? Interpolation? I guess you say it, Randy. Interpolation. Interpolation, yeah. which comes into writing software code and, you know, how we interject something into something that's pre-existent. May I say it that way? That's a fair, that's a fair assessment of it, yeah. Okay, so... Claudia and I, because we've been together and we've been playing together for a long time. And um, and it just hit me. It was like, shit, all this internet, all these banking systems, all these tracking systems, all this software that's out there, right? I mean, we can't even comprehend how much software has been written. Reservation <laughs> systems, re you know, the whole thing, the apps. The, and then thinking the task of trying to bring us into the mainframe is that they're tweaking constantly. They're interjecting code, right? But they've Drives got a, me crazy. And, and, but they've got this base platform software, right? So they're mm -hmm. just putting in new code. 
well, it's not all computing very well. That's why, you know, and I thought, huh, I wonder if they're going to bring it down by doing this, because it seems like a fool's mission to me. And unless they've got somebody or they're writing new systems right now and they're going to take this all down and put something else out. I don't know. It's just like the glitches are so they're they're stupid. I don't think they have the capability. I don't. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I don't think so either. And so, like, there's this thing of like evil has the seeds of its own destructions within it. Yeah. And, you know, we don't need to get all upset and get our pitchforks and, you know, go protest at the Capitol. We just need to be, like you were saying, what's the interjection of our consciousness with the whole thing? I find I just stopped entertaining all these thoughts put out there by the media, by the internet, whatever, all this caremongering, this, that, and the other. And it makes myself feel much clearer when when there's no chatter of things, most of which are lies anyway. Well, you're you know. seeing it in, in your industry, you know, they're changing the programs in her. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's like, crazy. They're, trying to, they're trying to comply with all these new regulations. And if it's a multinational, every bank, every system, they all have these new regulations of control they're trying to put in. And like here in Mexico, I mean, they're putting, making people have apps on their phones to do online banking. Nobody in the banks even knows how to operate that. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it it is very, very tenuous, let's say. This is, um, this is where we hit the singularity. But, you know, I go back to the 90s and dealing with some of the concepts of what was called the singularity. I was on Usenet groups, which is old school internet, going back to dial up telephones and BBS boards in the 90s and there were groups then on the bbs's called extropians which were futurists and many of those futurists are the people that you now have being paraded before you on the internet presenting these ideas this is where software developers lived in in the late 90s probably from the mid 90s forward to about 2000 when the internet began to mature and the concepts that they were putting forward were exactly what we're being told now uh it it was pre meta it was pre-immersive holographic ai but it was then looking at the biological human as largely being an inconvenience and the expression of consciousness being digitized to the point where we would eventually <clears throat> go into a holographic landscape it was basically the design that's distilling millions and millions of messages and signals over the years. I walked away from it realizing that this was extremely mechanistic, humanistic perspective, scientism. In other words, taking the sum of knowledge we have scientifically at any given point and using that as the means to define ourselves when in fact that field of knowledge is always expanding and in fact the the flaw of ai and the flaw of the singularity and the flaw of all of these software updates which is us if this is the point i dare say of the programs that were put into place during the pandemic was largely to create a system where they could begin to do biological updates mm-hmm. and to have a gateway into the human biological system and specifically RNA DNA complexes as a means to gain access to something that sits beyond this dimension this is one of the things that the guides bring out in the receiver's material what the flawed aspect is that we've conceived that dna is two strands of components 
and the interaction of the RNA and then the synthetics, which is now the mRNA. And they have assumed that this is their gateway towards gaining command and control on one level digitally of what I call the eternity codes, the human existence beyond the construct, beyond the realm, beyond the perception of this present reality. And see, this is the alien gray concept. This is very much not all. And, they, you know, you paint with a broad brush because it's not all of them. But the abduction scenarios that were presented as being, you know, alien grays largely had to do with that type of situation where people were abducted, people were put on tables, they were examined, they had um, biological materials extracted from them. You know, I think we understood that the greys were kind of cold and emotionless and did not understand our emotions. That was my experience. But that on one level, the greys, again, being a projection, a us in the future, coming back to attempt to renegotiate the situation that they created as a result of their own blindness. And in fact, warning us, which is us talking to us through the ancestral <laughs> chains that are the continuum of consciousness that streams forward and backward at any given time, giving us the opportunity to correct positions and to go on a different course, which is where humanity, I believe, is right now collectively. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, this gets wordy. I keep... You know, my brain keeps riffing to try and find something that concretizes this. And I realize these are words and they're they're imperfect and they're never going to. At some point, you fold your hands and you just go, yep. I want to understand. Yes. Yeah. And yet, like, it, it is our means, current means, current right now. I mean, we talked about communion and there is a, there is communion happening all the time but we're talking into a screen distances away from each other. And so we, you know, if we just all sat here and vibrated, I don't think I'd be very interested. And maybe that, well, that's kind of, you know, sort of what you do on a spiritual journey. At some point, right, you get your right. mantra <laughs> and you sit and you meditate and you come into, come into a place of presence. Wait, wait. Just a side insert. Have you seen? I know you. You know Frank Jacobs, right? I do. In fact, I was supposed to interview Frank when I got ill the last time. Okay. So, so have you seen his recent stuff with uh, Inspired Channel? It's I've not actually viewed it. I'm aware of it. Okay. So I he did the Looking Glass, and I wasn't interested. Right. I know Frank. Also, I doubt he remembers me at all. I've met Frank. I met Fra both Frank and Tanya. Me too. So, 2013, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So I met them in 2012. So, but this particular series, it's really, really Frank has like matured a lot, and he, they're talking about exactly what you're saying, Randy. But it's a synthetic. Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's the term they're using for it. And it makes, from what you're saying right now, it makes a lot of sense to me, right? And, but the way that he gets in, they get in really deep to the Heart Math Institute, to all these uh, outer yeah. layers of what's really driving it, right? And it all sounds beautiful and good. And we're all going to get together and meditate. And we've got monitors all over the planet. And we're going, you know, we're going to be, but now they even have an app that'll tell you if you're in the right frame of consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you can just see where they're pushing the, and it is coming through this. And oftentimes there's a spiritual awakening through somebody and they have a wonderful message, but then they get pulled off into this trying to map what you're saying through the biology they want to know everything that's ticking, but they don't get it and they can't get it and they'll never get it. I mean, like you said, Claudia. there's a calculus that goes on with that because that's all based on, again, a, a linear progression. If this mm -hmm. then that process, you know, again, so I don't know exactly. And, you know, I need to reconnect with Frank um, 
because I do want to do this interview. Looking Project Looking Glass comes into play with the eye of the needle material heavily. What I understand about looking glasses, first off, there was no technology per se. Technology was used only in order to aggregate data. The technology was actually humans who were harnessed to a telepathic system and that the military was using just as, as it had designed in the original SRI remote viewing experiments out at, out at Stanford Research in Institute. And that they discovered that, that the human being has the ability to pierce the temporal veil and gather intelligence. This is the essence of remote viewing, remote but on, view. a, exactly. on, a, on a temporal level. The problem with it is that they began using this intelligence information based on the concept that time itself is linear. Time itself has a cause and effect progression. See, I don't know how they don't know this because at the same time, they're dealing with off-world beings who do holographic inserts. But somehow or another, they had the idea that they could continue to work this. And they used it through 2001 forward especially, and then before this as well, but specifically after 2001, they were heavily reliant on it because they were very nervous about the 2012 window. Mm -hmm. And in 2010, and I was told this by a, remote, a female remote viewer who was a part of, part of a, a, a special access program who left the program, and the final communication I had with her was that the system had come down they no longer had a window they no no longer could see they could no longer project outcomes reliably that the, the collective consciousness that had been project looking glass itself had started to disintegrate in the face of the 2012 window they could not see past it mm -hmm. and so basically what looking glass was was uh, a, a remote viewing program based on a temporal window that was disappearing. And then what happened is we got to 2012. And if you remember, I, I remember how many people were so pissed off about 2012 because A, the world didn't fall apart and B, we didn't descend. Well, those were all, those were all concepts that were dependent on our expectations and our own projections of this. I mean, a lot of people just look like fools. But the truth of the matter is, something did occur and continued to occur and the occurrence in my opinion and this is only my opinion and it is only my interpretation was the eclipse in 2017 which showed me the shifting of platforms and that shifting of platforms being this projection into a seven-year period where we were deterministically able to begin to understand and then act upon the information we were getting collectively about our reality, how to get that view outside of the simulation long enough to understand it and then integrate our experience here with whom we actually are. In other words, the kids in the tree fort coming back home for dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in my words, it's the prime directive. Mm. That's what you stated. Like, and that's why I feel a lot of us are withdrawing our uh, attention to the outward manifestation mm. of a comic book narrative that's breaking down every time you look yeah. at it. We've done our work there. Okay. Mm. Our, our literally the awakening truth consciousness, those that truly sought truth, not just the next big story, that, that they can't keep it together. It, it, we don't, we, that work's done. And I think what you're saying right now, Randy, is that. The, where we are is that reconnection with all the aspects that we've talked about today, whether this is the shadow of the I that is having, that's yeah. always been home, right? And that there's nowhere for I to go. I am. I mean, it's so, mm -hmm. I get goosebumps when I say it because I don't yeah. even really know what that means. I just know it has a resonance in my field. And it, it, it as I, I wrote, and I, we were going to have a, I was going to have a surprise for you today, Randy. 
but it didn't manifest. And that was that Jeffrey was going to join us. Oh, that would have been so awesome. <laughs> that would have I been yeah. spill the beans to Claudia. I had the opportunity right after, to revisit that. Uh, oh my God. Right after I talked with you on Sunday, I had a extremely similar conversation with him. And I mean, he is ready to come and talk again, but he's in Canada and he's got a bad connection. And he, he well, just send him my love because I will. He'll hear I'm rebuilding my website. And that was one of the first things that went back up okay. was that video. So what um, he said to me, and it was just like, all of this, all these words the three of us are putting out right now, if you're reading scripture, if you're reading ancient texts, if wherever you're investigating where your heart, le heart leads you, this can only be understood with the heart. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. and, and, and it doesn't often, most of the time, it does not transcribe to language as we know it. But we've talked, we've touched on some really, really like, I'm all excited here. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of vibrating too. I, I think uh, where I've been the last few weeks is that uh, on some level, this became an industry, the truth industry. Exactly. And, oh my God. You know, I, I came to realize, <laughs> I came to realize that if what we talked about today, if we summarize it, and I'm still writing. I I want to put a book out, but I want to put the book out because I want to summarize my experience of doing what I've done for the last, we'll say, 11 years. I think once we summarize it, there's on some level nothing to say, which sort of kills the whole industry. <laughs> and maybe that's what we have to do is we have to kill the industry. I, I think being able to spin through this with words and, you know, Claudia is the least wordy of us here today. And, and in some ways, yet your presence was kind of very much felt in terms of how you emanate a certain concept and idea of both who you are and who we are. I'm like... Is there a point where the words stop? Is there a point where the concepts stop? Is there a point where we can just be? And maybe we underscore that. I don't know. Um, well, it's just taking a moment, a breath right now. And mm -hmm. I do want to acknowledge that about Claudia and driving into town today to set up for this call. I was, as always, you know, but how I'm like this relationship I have with this beautiful being called Claudia, yeah. right? But the yeah. it, it's never varied in its way. Like it's so solid and ethereal at the same moment. And what she's always done for me is hold a big space. Space, yeah. You know, and it's a non judgmental thing. And it's just like, and I, I feel like that's like, that's the Claudia I know, right? That and you know, not you know, I sometimes run around in circles and she just like <laughs> you know, holds a space and and it's beautiful because we're all needed in our own. I mean, just what you said, Randy. Is you know, it's interesting because I'm looking at the screen. I don't know what anybody else's screen looks like, but you and I are at the top and Claudia's on the bottom. She's like the base holding up these two other squares. <laughs> and it's a solid foundation. I really like sort of the the, the triunity that, that occurs of, mm -hmm. of doing this kind of conversation. And it was probably ordained that we do this is the three of us today. Yeah, I, I think so too, Randy. And I know we can go on, but you know, you've already brought up how many more words do we need? I think we've given people enough. Yeah. You know, and let's, I mean, I would like to think that and we said it before, and if we have, as time opens that door for us, that we have more of these type of conversations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it is yeah. an individual journey. You see, that's what, you know, they, we're not going to find right now in any group. You know, I mean, we have our friendships and we talk and we share and you do what you do, Randy. 
but it's it's like it it's dependent on us on our own response yeah. which is yeah. our ability to respond properly i think the difference is that years ago i took the old christian concept you know go to all the world and preach the gospel uh-huh. and i think on some level that mission expired for me a few years ago it's expired right now. <laughs> um, I'm not here to convince anybody. I'm not here to sell anybody anything. <clears throat> um, I think having conversations which stimulate ideas is important. Mm-hmm. I think holding space for that to occur is extremely crucial and important. And I think, as the guides have said many times to me and to the people who partake of those We are here to be. We are here to express ourselves as beings of light energy in forms that interact with the environment and with other beings in ways that we don't completely consciously grasp. That ultimately your presence on this world, every person here, is equally important because it's a dynamic balance of beings. And the conflicts, the chaos, these things will resolve over time. Will it be a perfectly peaceful planet? It will never be perfectly peaceful, but we can resolve to move to the next level and hold space for a time when we do move out of the construct long enough to see the big picture again. And that's that's really the goal from my standpoint. I also want to say, Randy, if you are thinking of, or if you're planning or wanting to write a book, you definitely should do it because you've accumulated such a wealth of knowledge combined with experience and you have this, non-judgmental way of getting it across that anyone who comes across this book will take some of that wealth for their own development. So I would Thank love you. to you write this. And if you need an editor, both Christine and Shane know my red pen well. <laughs> I do, actually. I did know that Shane told me that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank that, you for that. That's an encouragement because I've been back and forth on it. I yeah. view my experience as being that I spent 11 years talking to some of the, probably some of the most amazing people on earth. Right. Some of whom are not very well known, some of whom were here for a brief time and have since disappeared and gone off into another existence. And um, that's the gift that I received was being able to have those conversations and now kind of maybe distill that. But I think that's what what all of us are doing on some level. We're miners. We're mining this reality. Well, it's wisdom, you know. I mean that that doesn't. Most people aren't born with wisdom, you know. That's true. That's true. <laughs> right, and so and that I've been talking to some, you know, some friends of mine that are struggling. They're struggling with who they are, what they are, what's going on, you know. And they're in their sixties and seventies, and I'm like, don't you realize that you're you're super important right now? You're the last link mm-hmm, with what mm-hmm. came before the technology. Yeah. And you, Andy, is super important because you were part of that technology when it started. I know. <laughs> you know, and so it's like whatever, and that's why I feel like I need to keep writing and I need to <clears throat> speak in the way that I speak is because think of the, I mean, the young people right now, they need wisdom. They need yeah, their they elders. Do. Yeah, they they do. need their elders. Yeah. I mean, like who out you know who who out there and you know somebody could come across let's say this talk and all of this stuff maybe they knew something about it but it it, it sparked something in them because ultimately is remember who you are know thyself remember who you are that's probably the best words the best words of all you know remember who you are and and we've already gone over all of that. So, you know, and I realize that the, that is the one thing that's been 
Claudia holds this beautiful space with all that's in it, the music, mm-hmm. the music of the spheres, the, the whole thing. And I realize that, you know, I, that's always been my message to anybody I have contact with. And it's like, really wake up, really remember who you are. Yeah. And it, you know, it comes through me now through my ancestry. It comes through me now through, you know, uh, my own remembering. But that's all I knew I had to do was if I could wake up, if I could remember and then inspire others to do the same because it goes against the whole front of the construct. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not an easy what task. Construct? Hmm? What construct? That's We'll end on that. What construct? <laughs> <laughs> what construct, guys? <laughs> exactly. What construct? Oh, the one you build around you. Love you both so much. Love you too. Love you both. Um, This has been awesome. I'm vibrating. (laughs) 